So, what's going on? Basically, it's not too hard to figure out. American Jews are overwhelmingly liberal. And liberal in the United States, what does it mean? It means support for the rule of law, support for equality under the law, support for international institutions, support for the peaceful resolution of, crisis, uh, of conflicts, uh, not the reflexive resort to force. Uh, that's what it means to be liberal in the United States. And American Jews are having more and more difficulty, difficulty reconciling their liberal ethos, their liberal values, their liberal credo, reconciling their liberalism with the way Israel carries on. There was a time, and there are a lot of people in this room who are roughly of my age cohort, uh, there was a time when it was not difficult at all for American Jews to reconcile their liberalism with Israel, uh, because in a tiny part, but still a part, uh, there were aspects of Israeli society that had uh, progressive and inspiring elements to them. We should be you know, honest enough to recognize that. But mostly uh, it's because Israel was very successful in its propaganda, uh, very successful in its public relations. Uh, and um, most people found no problem reconciling being liberal with Israel. And everybody in the room knows the cliché is the only democracy in the Middle East, makes the desert bloom, the kibbutzim, the socialism, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's impossible to do that nowadays. Um, American Jews are highly literate. I think about 95% attend college. You go into a college classroom now and you look at the textbooks. The textbooks are very different than in the previous, my, even my own generation. Uh, up until fairly recently, you could say up until the 1990s, most of the scholarship in the Israel-Palestine conflict, it was more or less, and I'm not being facetious, it was more or less Leon Uris's exodus with footnotes. Uh, that's what the scholarship consisted of. Uh, I read Exodus very late in life. I only read it because uh, when he died, somebody asked it, me for an interview on him. Uh, so I said, all right, let me sit down and read some of his stuff. And I was struck by how much the Leon Uris version of history was actually the dominant one, not just in the popular media, but also in scholarship until fairly recently. Uh, nowadays, the textbooks, incidentally, most of them authored by Israelis, uh, present a very different picture of Israel's past. Human rights organizations, for reasons which I can't go into now, present a very different picture of Israel's present. And so it's just nearly impossible, if not impossible, uh, for American Jews to consistently, to appear consistent in their espousal of liberal values uh, with the way Israel carries on. Uh, most people now who are roughly in my age cohort, uh, they grew up in that generation, sort of like the, the spirit of that generation, the generation of the 60s, the spirit of it was captured in the, the uh, uh, I'm not sure if you call it slogan, but uh, in the, all we are saying is give peace a chance. Who knows that? Raise your hand. So, oh my gosh. Is this a church or a senior citizen home? <laughs> so when I say three, oh, one, two, three. All we are saying is give peace a chance. Let's see you sway a little. <laughs> okay. So, you know, that's the memory of the, the memory of most people in the older age cohort in our society who are Jewish. And uh, it's very difficult to reconcile that with a country uh, basically that says all we are saying is give war a chance and give war another chance and give war another chance and give war another chance. Uh, it's just very hard to reconcile your youthful memories, the idealism of your youth, even if you've grown somewhat cynical, uh, there's still a part of you that, uh, for whom Sonny and Cher, I got you babe, it resonates. Uh, and it's hard to reconcile that with the kind of uh, certifiable lunacy uh, that emanates from Israel on a virtually daily basis. 
It's particularly true if you look at the poll data. It's particularly true of the younger generation, what they call the under 40 age cohort, uh, where you can see uh, very, diff uh, very definite estrangement, alienation, or indifference uh, to Israel. And that's, you know, not hard to, uh, not hard to uh, figure out. You're young, you're Jewish, you're in a college campus, you're idealistic, that's uh, liberal, that's what most Jews are like on a college campus. They're young, they're idealistic, they're liberal, uh, and they're hopeful about people and about humanity. And then it's 2006, July, August, Israel invades Lebanon, the 34 days uh, invasion. Uh, the U.S. Condoleezza Rice is doing everything she can to block a U.N. resolution, hoping that uh, Israel can knock out the Hezbollah, the party of God. Uh, unfortunately or fortunately, uh, Israel is unable to do so. And then finally, Condoleezza Rice decides, I think we'd better end this now because it's not looking good for Israel. She lets the resolution uh, go through the Security Council, and the war is over. The war is over. And now we're just waiting. We need 72 hours to implement it on the ground. So what does Israel do in those last 72 hours when the war is already over? Uh, Israel drops 4 million cluster bomblets uh, on South Lebanon. It was the densest use of cluster bombs in the history of the world on an area, on the, on the defined area, uh, and the war is already over. If you, um, if you read the Human Rights Watch report on what happened, it's called Flooding South Lebanon. It's sort of like out of a science fiction movie. Uh, you have these houses where the entire ceilings are uh, saturated with these cluster bomblets. So you're young, you're Jewish, you're in a college campus. You don't want to have to defend that. It's just not, it's not really possible to defend. 2008-9, Israel invades Gaza. Uh, the 22 days of death and destruction. Uh, Israel uses the white phosphorus, a substance that reaches 1,500 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, you people in California, you know something about hot weather. Uh, so try to imagine uh, 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, as Oprah would say, try to wrap your mind around that one. And what does Israel do with the white phosphorus? Well, it drops it on the school, it drops it on the humanitarian warehouse, and it drops it on two hospitals, Al Wafa Hospital and Al Quds Hospital. Uh, you're young, you're Jewish, you're in a college campus. You really don't want to have to defend that. No, you don't. I mean, there are people who will defend it. You know, presumably Rush Limbaugh's son will defend it. Uh, maybe uh, Sean Hannity's daughter, uh, Sarah Palin's whatever, uh, will, def <laughs> will defend it. But it's just not a Jewish thing. Jews don't want to be put in that position because it's a, the Jewish tradition, the liberal. Uh, and uh, they'd rather not have be put in the awkward, really morally impossible position of having to dis defend the dropping white phosphorus uh, on hospitals. And so there has been, uh, as I say, feelings ranging from estrangement to uh, <coughs> positive indifference uh, to Israel, especially among that younger generation. And if you follow the Jewish publications, there's these periodic panic attacks uh, that were losing this younger generation of Jews. So, all told, the general picture is that there's now a broad public that's ready to listen. Now, the public has always known that there's a problem in that part of the world. Israel-Palestine has always been above the radar. Uh, what's different now is for the first time in living memory, for the first time in living memory, the public is willing to acknowledge, or does acknowledge, that Israel bears a significant burden of culpability for what's going awry in that part of the world. 
that's new. Whether they accept that Israel bears the preponderance of culpability or all the culpability, no. But is there an awareness that Israel bears a significant burden of culpability for what's going on there? I think the answer is yes. So now the public is ready to listen. And the challenge is, well, how do you get that public to act, to move, to galvanize it, to do something? And here I think the most important, or one of the most important challenges for us now is, we have to be careful not to lose the public. And not losing the public means the following. People are practical uh, in, in these sorts of things. They say, okay, we know something terrible is happening in that part of the world. And we know, yeah, Israel doesn't have clean hands. We know it's part of the problem. Uh, uh, it's not just the Palestinians, but it's also Israel. Or not just the Arabs, but it's also Israel. Uh, so now they ask the obvious question. Well, how do you solve the problem? What do you propose? What's your solution? Uh, if they put that question and then the response they get is, this gentleman over here, he says, well obviously the answer is two states. But the woman next to him says, no, not two states, we need one state. But then the woman next to her says, no, we don't need one state, we need a uh, binational state. And the fellow next to him says, no, we need a federated state. And the woman next to him says, no, we need an Islamic state. Well, when they hear this cacophony of solutions, the public, rightfully, I think, just throws his hands up in despair and says, well, if they don't know what we want, what they want, how will we know? And we lose them. And we lose, I think, a real opportunity uh, to reach a public which is ready to listen now, and that we can present a unified message on how to resolve the conflict and the unified message uh, seems to resonate with their own sense of right and wrong, then we have, I think, a real opportunity to do what we need to do, which is to build a mass movement. Because if we're not trying to build a mass movement, I'm not quite sure what we're trying to do, but it's certainly not what I want to be part of. So now the question is, so to speak, as we called it in my generation, the $64 question, uh, now the question is, okay, what is the message that you're going to give the public? How are you going to resolve or reconcile all these different formulas for ending the conflict? And that to me, I have to say, was a puzzle. The puzzle was, how do you formulate a goal? What is the basis for formulating a goal? I couldn't quite figure that out. There's an unfortunate tendency in the Israel-Palestine conflict to personalize these questions, and so formulating a goal consists of going up to people and saying, what do you support, one state or two states? Uh, as if you're in a restaurant and you're choosing from a Chinese menu, one from column A and one from column B. Uh, that didn't sound right to me. Uh, so I decided some years back, I was gonna go back to the source and see what uh, Mr. Gandhi had to say in the topic. Uh, he had extensive experience with uh, mass movements. Uh, I do believe, but time doesn't allow me to go into it now, that Palestinians don't have an armed option. Uh, the, I'm not saying whether it's uh, moral or immoral, for the moment we'll leave that aside. Just as a practical matter, I don't think they have an armed option. I think the only way they can rid uh, and the, eject the Israelis and end the occupation uh, is through the kinds of mass civil resistance and civil disobedience uh, that Gandhi practiced and also preached. So I looked at what Mr. Gandhi had to say in the subject. How do you formulate a goal? Uh, what's the basis for it? What's the criterion? Um, and uh, Gandhi wrote, uh, some of you may know, his is a rather large corpus. It runs to 100 volumes. Each volume is about 500 pages. Uh, I read through half of it, the period from 30 to 47. Uh, most of it has very little to do with politics. Uh, Gandhi's main uh, focus, his, the focus of his work was good diet and good health. Uh, he was a kind of premature Oprah. Uh, he was absolutely obsessed by his weight. Um, uh, obviously in a different category than Oprah. And uh, also, uh, he was uh, 
obsessed by home cures. He had a home cure for everything, uh, everything ranging from constipation to impotence. Uh, Gandhi had a home cure for it. I'm not sure how successful they were in practice, but he was certainly confident. And Gandhi had opinion on every subject, although he freely admitted he hadn't a clue what he was talking about, but that never stopped him from giving opinions. But obviously, in the question of politics, um, Gandhi had lots of clues about what he was talking about. He had rich life experience, he was a very shrewd political analyst, um, and um, I think uh, he's rich in insight. So let me try to run through what I think are the pertinent observations of Gandhi for our own concerns about how do you formulate a goal, how to resolve the conflict, how to solve it. Uh, the first thing that Gandhi says is, Politics is not about trying to change public opinion. Now, many people here will probably raise their eyebrows at that. What do you mean? Aren't we trying to bring enlightenment to the benighted masses? Aren't we trying to free them from false consciousness and commodity fetishism and all that other stuff? No, Gandhi had a totally different understanding of politics. Gandhi starts from the premise that most people know what's wrong with society. They're not stupid. Everybody sees through, or most people see through, the thousand and one wrongs in our society. Everybody in this room has that experience. You get up in the morning, and from the moment you get up, you look around you, that's not fair. That shouldn't be. That's unjust. That shouldn't happen in a society like ours. Uh, we all know that. For Gandhi, the problem was not that people were ignorant, not that people were stupid, not that people were benighted. The problem was people didn't do anything about it. Like most of you, including me, uh, we pass most of the day venting and complaining, but we don't actually act on, the fa act on our knowledge of the injustice. So for Gandhi, the challenge was, how do you get people to act? How do you turn them from sympathetic, passive observers into active participants. How do you turn that broad public, which is now ready to listen, how do you turn them into a movement? That, for Gandhi, was the challenge. Gandhi's insight, which many of you might find trivial, and it was actually, it took a long time for it to register with me. Gandhi's basic insight was, the only thing that really gets a broad public to act to move from passive sympathy into active participation, the only thing that gets them to act is to see people suffer. If they don't see suffering, they're not going to do anything. So you have to get yourself arrested. You have to go to jail. You have to go on fasts and suffer. You have to, for Gandhi, get your, and I'm using his language, not mine, you have to get your skulls cracked. And most importantly for Gandhi, and this is completely erased from the uh, image of Gandhi. The most important thing for Gandhi is you've got to get yourself killed. Uh, Gandhi, if you read the real Gandhi, not the Hollywood Gandhi, the real Gandhi is a kind of death cult. It's you've got to get yourself killed. And sometimes his followers would say, but Mahatma, I got myself arrested with a big smile and proud. Gandhi said, please don't talk to me about arrested. I want to hear that you got killed. No. You see, you're, you're laughing, but I promise you I'm not in the least bit exaggerating. People will be quite shocked. I wrote a little book on the topic, and I have long passages. People will be quite shocked uh, by what, how Gandhi sounds uh, on the subject. But in fact, you know, it wasn't a death cult in the, in the sense that Gandhi made a virtue of death. It was the realization that it's really only getting yourself killed that moves the public. If they don't see people getting killed, the public doesn't act. So, um, you know, I see some people with perplexed looks in their face. So let me give a, a, a typical example, uh, which everybody in this room will know from their own life experience in the past couple of years. So uh, a while ago, I'm sitting in my apartment listening to the radio, I start hearing about all these people that are gathering in this park down by 
uh, the Wall Street call, I don't know, I thought it was Zucchini Park or something. Uh, I know, but I heard Zucchini. Um, <laughs> Zucchini, Zuccotti Park, protesting the policies in Wall Street. Uh, they're camping in the park. I thought to myself, that's great, young people are finally doing something. But you know what, Norm, your Woodstock days are over, you're not going down to the park, and if you did, they'd probably throw you out because, you know, a senior citizen vagrant or something. So I'm not going to do anything but all power to them. I hope they do. I hope they succeed. Uh, and then the next thing you know, I'm listening to the radio and I hear 800 people get arrested on the Brooklyn Bridge. I think to myself, well, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I think, well, hey, now wait a minute. 800 people got themselves arrested? I've spent my whole life since probably age 15 venting against the capitalist system, all of its inequities, unfairness, and so forth. And now 800 people are getting arrested and I'm not doing anything about it. And then the next few days, I see the um, news footage of the police pepper spraying the kids uh, who are peacefully protesting. And that finally did it. That turned you know, a corner for me. Now I'm going to go out and do something. And that's Gandhi. Nobody had to tell people that 99%, as in we are the 99%, are getting shafted. The 99% already knew it. They didn't need to be enlightened. They knew it. The challenge was how to get them to take their knowledge and indignation and turn it into a practical movement. And what did it for many people were the arrests, the pepper spray, things like that. That's what gets people to act. Uh, in the case of the civil rights movement, if I were to ask any person from that generation, what are the scenes they remember the most from the civil rights movement? Everyone will say the kids who were attacked in the Woolworths counter, Everyone will say when the, do the police dogs, the German shepherds, were sicked on the children. Everyone will say Schwerner, Cheney, Goodman. That's what gets people to act. It's scenes like that. And that was Gandhi's, I think, major insight. And it's actually not uh, at all, I think, a trivial one. I think, frankly, he's basically right. But that's only half the story. The other half of the story, which is equally important, is a public is never going to act unless they agree with your goals, your aims, your ends. It's not enough that your means are innocent, that is to say, nonviolent civil disobedience, nonviolent resistance. If they don't agree with your ends, they're never going to join you and they're never going to act with you. So what does that mean in, practical, uh, in, in, in a practical sense? Means, ends, and always starts like philosophy 101. I don't want to hear from it. You know, I'm going to take home economics. Uh, but let's try to take a, a practical example. So who in this room would wish to identify him or herself as being strongly pro-choice? Raise your hand. OK, I want to see an emphatic pro-choice. OK, this woman here, I could see. Okay, so American society, uh, according to most public uh, opinion polls, it's a uh, divide right down the middle in the question of abortion. One half call themselves pro-choice, one half call themselves pro-life. That's basically uh, what the polls show. Uh, you're shaking your head, maybe we look at different data, but maybe it's actually changed a little, but let's just say hypothetically for now, uh, one half pro-choice, one half pro-life. So, let's take a little thought experiment. Let's imagine the one half of American society that calls itself pro-life. It decides it's going to use a Gandhian tactic. We're going to march en masse down to all the abortion clinics in the United States, and we're going to go into a, on a fast until the death, until and unless these abortion clinics stop performing abortions. Now, nobody can take exception to their means Nobody can take exception to their means. It's, you know, Gandhian tactics. We're not going to hurt anyone except ourselves. In fact, we're, going to, we're willing to pay the ultimate price, our lives, in order to uh, achieve our ends. 
So it's a very traumatic scene, half of the American population, 150 million people descending on the abortion clinics, uh, we're going to go on the fast until the death. Will that persuade you? No, she says emphatically, no, it's not going to persuade me. In fact, most pro-choice people think, I hope they do go on the fast until the death, <laughs> and I hope they all drop dead. So, unless there is, a, unless there is agreement on the ends, on the goals, the nonviolent civil disobedience uh, can't possibly work. Global Voices for Justice is a nonprofit media organization. Our mission is to bring to you independent thinkers and analysts who enhance our understanding of the world we live in. Your financial support enables us to achieve our mission. With a minimum $12 contribution, you will receive a copy of this talk. Thank you.